We have six things today that we're going to go over on our agenda. The first is uh, we're going to have an update and some open remarks from Superintendent Brumley about the, the connectivity dashboard. And then we're going to have Dr. Welch and, and, and Dr. Cantor from the Office of Public Health uh, speak to us about the rapid testing availability, the antigen tests, the most recent updates on quarantine and contact tracing. Uh, we'll have an update on the superintendent reporting tool. And then we'll talk about next steps uh, for you as, as school systems, uh, charter schools, non-public schools, in order to, to request the, the rapid tests. So what I'll do at this time is we'll go to the next slide, our connectivity dashboard, and I'll turn it over to our state superintendent, Dr. Brumley, uh, to give a couple of open remarks and provide some reminders about our learning environment and connectivity tool. Thank you, Mr. Bradford. Um, so we just, um, as many of you know, uh, we have a very close partnership uh, with the Louisiana Department of Health. Uh, and we have partners in uh, other organizations, medical organizations throughout our state, and access uh, to those experts uh, really has been what has allowed us to uh, successfully navigate uh, through COVID-19 in our school systems and with each, uh, with each day uh, make even more progress in a positive way uh, towards ensuring that our, our kids get the education that they deserve and that we're also uh, maintaining the safety of our employees uh, throughout the state. But as we were having conversations um, earlier in the week about a, a few issues, uh, it just felt right that because of um, the significance of a few of these things that we go ahead and, and set up this call today uh, just so that we could deliver this information to you uh, in person, albeit uh, virtually, uh, because you know, like I said, we, we do feel that this is uh, fairly significant updates. Uh, as we know, uh, and as we have stated from the beginning of this, uh, this virus and our response to the virus uh, would be an evolving process. And so today's webinar is simply uh, another point in that evolution of us understanding more or adapting uh, as appropriate to help make sure that we are responding appropriately. So. We will not, you know, keep everyone here for a lengthy or, or a period of time that's unnecessary. We'll go in, get to the information, and, and get out after asking some questions. But we did, we did feel like uh, having this face-to-face -face virtually was important. The first thing I want to open up with is just uh, a thanks for all that you have done. Uh, I am consistently inspired and impressed uh, with the operations uh, on the ground uh, that I'm seeing that we are using to help mitigate this virus. And uh, I know that that has not been an easy task. I know oftentimes that's frustrating. Uh, I know oftentimes you're looking for an answer that may or may not exist. Uh, but I can tell you uh, that just across the state, you are doing an outstanding job navigating uh, your kids and your, your teachers and your communities through this. We did release uh, the learning environment and connectivity tool uh, to the public. Uh, last week or, or, or the week before, and uh, this reopening dashboard is, is now available on our Strong Start page, so the general public can go in and they can look at information uh, about our systems, the, the formats, modalities in which uh, systems are operating, uh, they, the, um, the amount of, of devices uh, that systems have, uh, the lack or, uh, of, of connected students, um, et cetera. As I shared from the beginning, this was, information was important for our public to know uh, each individual systems and the statewide response, but also so that we could at, at some point um, advocate appropriately and effectively based on the information that we had in terms of how many devices are in the field, uh, what does connectivity look like, uh, et cetera. So thank you for, for submitting information, but that uh, reopening dashboard is only as good as the, the, the data points that uh, are available, and we need uh, submission of updates uh, from time to time uh, from systems so that uh, that reopening dashboard is, is current. So that tool is, is available to easily track a number of things. You see those bullets here, not going to go through and read those, but I just, I, I do wanna spend just a brief moment in, in encouraging you that if you have not updated 
that reopening uh, dashboard information to, to please do that so that the information that we have available to our public and to our policymakers is, is up to date. And as, sim as a simple example, if I go in and look today at the percentage of students that are virtual, fully virtual, hybrid, uh, or um, fully face-to-face, -face, or if I go in and look at uh, number of devices that are available, I know that that's probably not exactly accurate because I know there's been a, a switch to from virtual to hybrid in many cases and from hybrid to fully face-to-face -face in some cases. And I know that also additional uh, devices, Chromebooks particularly, have been delivered in the system. So now you are you would have greater numbers and, and also you've connected additional students. So just want to put in a plug uh, to update that um, information uh, at, at, at uh, your convenience. Thank you, Dr. Bromley. We'll transition next to uh, Dr. Welch from the Office of Public Health, uh, who will provide us with uh, some reminders and some overall updates relative to COVID-19. So Dr. Welch, if you're on, uh, with further ado, please, please join us. Ken, I am here, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, everybody. And uh, it, it's been uh, uh, about two or three weeks since I spoke to you all. And I just wanted to give you a couple of real simple reminders. Um, uh, uh, as, as Secretary Brumley mentioned, um, I myself am also really impressed with, with how seriously school systems are taking uh, the COVID virus and, and just remind you all of the simple tips that we want you to take on every single day um, to help prevent the spread of coronavirus. It looks like we are headed into winter, which is going to be serious for us all. What I want to take everybody back to is back in March and April when we thought that, uh, or we're saying, you know, during the summer, maybe coronavirus was going to go away a little bit because of the warmer weather. Well, what that also implies, and we do know, is that coronavirus spreads easier in colder weather. And that's because we close the doors and windows and, and congregate together. So, just a simple reminder, um, keep up those, those uh, COVID prevention um, mechanisms. Masks, they work. The governor's mask order is still in effect. Um, there's been some confusion about that. Um, there is no medical confusion about that, however, at all. Masks prevent that 40% of people who have coronavirus and do not know that they have it from spreading coronavirus to other people. Um, hand hygiene um, and surface hygiene, six feet of social distance, staying home if you're sick and contacting your doctor um, and staying away from sick people. These uh, uh, simple prevention tips are really what keeps us safe from COVID and keeps those levels down. Um, we're kind of at a steady rate now in Louisiana, but I'm sure anyone who has watched the news recently has seen the vast uptick in the rest of the country. Um, I'm hopeful that the reason we don't have that vast uptick in Louisiana is pe because people still are taking it uh, uh, seriously. However, um, um, until we have an effective vaccine and some effective treatments that work early in the course of illness, these are our prevention tools. Uh, Ken, can you switch that slide? Um, so the second thing I'm going to talk about today is, is antigen testing. And there's a reason I'm going to talk about this, and that's what we're going to get into to next with some other people from the Office of Public Health. The antigen tests, those are the, the, the little tests and their little kits, and they take about 15 minutes. Um, and and uh, they are very, very useful in certain situations, and they're not so useful in other situations. Um, the reason we're having this call is because of, of an opportunity that is going to allow certain school systems that have the right criteria to have some of these, and we call it, the current brand name is Binex now, but there's probably going to be other antigen tests. Um, and, and the Office of Public Health has put out some guidance, um, and you see that in that first bullet there. What I'm actually going to do is, right after this webinar, I'm going to send that clinical guidance to uh, uh, Ken Bradford for him to share with you all. It's about two pages long. It's not too complicated. Um, but, but certainly, I'd like you all to see it all in detail. What it really does is, is walk you through which kind of tests there are and how you can use each kind of these tests and uh, what they're good for. Now, what I will tell you about these antigen tests, the Binex tests that some of you will be getting, um, they're most useful for individuals with signs and symptoms of COVID-19, meaning a sick person. 
that is where they are most useful. Um, if that test comes back positive on that 15 minute card, that person obviously should be considered positive and isolate for 10 days. If that little card is negative, but the person still has symptoms of COVID-19, they should get the other kind of test, the PCR test. That's the one that takes a few days with the swab up the nose and you have to send it away to a laboratory. Um, if a person has signs and symptoms of COVID, but the Binex is negative, you should follow that up with a PCR test. The other place where this is useful is if we know that there is a close contact of a person known to have COVID-19. And this really, test really should be uh, within 48 hours of identifying that close contact. And again, if the Binex Now test is positive, that person should be considered positive, whether they have symptoms or not, and, and isolate for 10 days. However, if the Binex test is negative on a person who is a close contact, that person should stay quarantined and watch for signs and symptoms for 14 days because they are a close contact of a case. If they do get symptoms, then they should follow that up with a test. However, these tests, again, like I said, are really useful when someone is sick or we know that they've had a contact. They are not so good for someone just walking down the street who has no signs and symptoms and no contact with a COVID case. Um, in that situation, people who might have coronavirus, even though they don't have any symptoms or contacts, you might get a negative result on this test. Or the reverse is also true. If someone does not have coronavirus, they've not had a contact, they don't have any symptoms, it might come up positive. It's called false positive and false negatives. And this screening test, the antigen test, if you use it for screening, it doesn't work nearly as well. So Louisiana Department of Health does not currently recommend antigen testing, the Binex Now testing, of asymptomatic individuals with no known contact to a COVID case. And these clinical utilities are going to be all listed in the testing guidance that I'm going to send to Ken Bradford uh, uh, after this call. Uh, Ken, next slide. So uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over. I believe uh, the Assistant Secretary, uh, Dr. Cantor, is on. Um, uh, Dr. Cantor, did you want to say a few words, or are we going to continue on uh, uh, to Mendy Richard? So I think you're still muted, uh, Joe. Let's just there we go. Yeah, we can continue to Mandy Richard, and I'll tie it in at the end. Thanks, Dr. Welch. Perfect, perfect. So next, uh, I'm going to turn it over to the director of the Louisiana Office of Public Health Lab, uh, Mandy Richard, who's going to talk about uh, the Binex Now rapid testing and an opportunity that's going to become available. Hi. Um, thank you for asking me to join today, and I'm happy to talk to you about the test that uh, Dr. Welch has just introduced. Um, this is a, a test that has been delivered to us from our federal partners with HHS. Uh, they are giving us uh, 1.4 million of these tests to be used in the state of Louisiana. And so one of the first reaches that we had was to the Department of Education to uh, talk with them about how it might be used in the school setting. And that's what Dr. Welch just went over. One of the challenges, however, is how to get these in the hands of the people who need to be doing the testing. Again, just to reiterate, this is great, a great tool when you want to know quickly if someone with symptoms uh, might be positive. It is fast, 15 minutes. It's like a greeting card uh, where you use a nasal swab and you, you put it in the greeting card and you add some drops. So it's, it's, it's inexpensive. These typically cost around $5 if you were to have to buy these. Um, it also doesn't require any kind of instrumentation. Uh, as Dr. Welch mentioned, it's not as sensitive or specific, um, meaning that it doesn't pick up test uh, results as well as the PCR, the COVID positive test as well. And it's not recommended, as Dr. Welch just walked through, for asymptomatic cases. It does, however, come with a nice little uh, app where when the testing is done, the individual can then later show their results to someone via their phone. Now, one of the things that makes this a little bit of a, a, a hurdle to get it into the hands of the people that are testing, it's what we call a point of care test. And point of care test, meaning that the test is actually performed, could potentially be performed right in front of the patient, it requires a, a certificate of waiver. So the state has a following CLIA, which is an, a, an acronym abbreviation for the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act of 1988 which put in a bunch of rules that said, in order to do testing and, uh, and to do reliable testing, these are the rules you have to follow. 
So the person doing the testing has to have a certificate of waiver issued by the Health Standards Office of the Department of Health. So in some cases, you may have a school that has a school clinic and does do some point of care testing and may have a CLIA number, a CLIA waiver. And in other cases, you may not. In those cases, we're going to, and we'll cover some next steps with you a little later in the presentation, but we're going to ask that you connect to a community healthcare partner in your area, let us know who that person is, we'll verify their CLIA, and we'll work with them. And then once we work with the person who's going to do the testing, we help put together the training, we help to make sure that the Abbott, the manufacturer, helps give the person who's doing the testing the appropriate training, we provide technical assistance, and we help facilitate the reporting because all results, even if they're done on a quick test, have to be reported to the epidemiology uh, department of the state. And so we help walk through those processes. So we're really here to facilitate the use of these 1.4 million tests, and we want to be your partner in using the test both appropriately and making sure that they are in your hands just as quickly as possible. Okay, next slide. Okay, I'll pass it on to uh, Teresa Sokol, our state epidemiologist. Hi everybody, can y'all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Teresa. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, sometimes I'm never quite sure when it comes to um, when it comes to audio. I'm often challenged. But hi, everybody. Um, my name is Teresa Sokol, as Mindy mentioned. I'm the acting state epidemiologist for LDH, and I'm going to provide a quick update related to contact tracing and quarantine of close contact in schools. So, as a lot of you may be aware, CDC recently updated the definition of a close contact. I think they did this um, right around October 21st. And the update was to include someone who is within six feet of an infected person for a cumulative total of 15 minutes over a 24 hour period. Now this is in contrast to their previous recommendation for the 15 minute period to be a continuous one. Please keep in mind though that prior to this sort of across the board change, LDH did utilize the same cumulative 15 minute guidance really on a case-by-case -case basis, and we looked at it according to other risk factors that may be at play, such as whether the exposure occurred in a poorly ventilated area or if the infected person might have been actively coughing, which would, of course, increase the risk for transmission. So with the new guidance, though, if an exposed individual, even if they didn't spend that continuous 15 minutes within six feet of an infected person, if, for example, they spent three separate 15 minute periods within six feet of an infected individual over a 24 hour period, that person would be considered a close contact across the board, regardless of any of these other risk factors that I sort of talked about and mentioned that we used to consider. Um, I see a question, does the wearing a mask matter with the new rule? It does not. Um, wearing a mask, it was not taken into consideration in determination of a close contact um, under the previous guidance, and that change has not, there has not been a change to that consideration for the new guidance either. So even if individuals are wearing a mask, this, we do know, as Dr. Welch mentioned, that wearing a mask works, but um, what we also know is that reduction of transmission for COVID needs to be a multi-layer process, um, that's where that social distancing comes in as well. So it really needs to sort of be, be all of these parts and pieces to really um, reduce the risk. So if someone is within six feet, even if they were wearing a mask, we would still count them as a close contact. I appreciate that question. It's important to clarify. Um, so another important update related to the LDH contact tracing guidance for K-12 schools um, is uh, related to the time period for recommendation of identification and quarantine of close contact when we're talking about suspected cases. So it used to be that we recommended that this contact tracing process in schools begin immediately upon identification of a suspected case, um, once the clinically compatible symptoms were identified and even before test results were obtained. Um, now, while this is the best practice for reduction of transmission to the greatest extent possible, 
you know, one thing we've learned through our partnership with schools is that we really needed to modify this guidance in order to improve the practical application of this process. Um, so as a result, we are now allowing for a delay of up to 48 hours after the suspect case meets those clinical criteria in order to allow for molecular or PCR test results for COVID-19 or for a more likely alternative diagnosis to be made for, by a healthcare provider. So let's say, for example, a student becomes symptomatic at school. If that student is immediately picked up by their parent or guardian, they're taken to a provider for testing. If the PCR results are received the next day and those results are negative, then the contact tracing process will not need to be initiated at all. At, at all. The key here is really going to be the, um, the speed of that response the evaluation with, by the healthcare provider, and then either obtaining the results or potentially an alternative diagnosis that would explain the symptoms if it's not related to COVID. Um, so the last thing I wanted to mention is that LDH has tried to really create a variety of tools that we hope are helpful to schools in the response to COVID-19. Um, some of these include that step-by-step -step contact tracing guidance, uh, pre-recorded presentation that reviews contact tracing and reporting for schools. Um, we also have a worksheet that can be used for collecting important information when a parent um, calls to report a student absence. We also have guidance and a presentation regarding the use of PPE in schools and a template letter that we have found that a lot of schools um, are able to use to provide written notification to students or staff uh, in schools that have been identified as close contact. And, and we found that that's been helpful in many situations. Um, and additionally, if there's other guidance that, that, um, that schools or um, anyone else identifies the need for, we're also happy to, um, to try to develop those uh, as, as needed as well. So please always feel free to reach out. And um, I appreciate having the opportunity to talk about this today. And I'll be on for the duration of the call if anybody has any questions. I think we're ready to move on to the next slide, which I believe is uh, Dr. Lee Mendoza, the director of our Bureau of Health Informatics. Hi, uh, thanks, Teresa. Uh, so I'm Lee Mendoza, director of the Bureau of Health Informatics in the Office of Public Health. And we've taken the data from the COVID-19 early warning system that's collected by Teresa's unit and built a reporting tool for superintendents. So this reporting tool will show by reporting week the number of cases within a school for a superintendent's district broken down by students, faculty, staff, volunteers, and itinerant workers. Uh, if I can share my screen real quick, I can give you an example of what this looks like. Here. So can everyone see my screen? Even though you can't see me, I have too much backlighting. Hello? Yep, we see your screen, so yeah. Okay, good. Great, thank you. All right, so this is for the fictitious St. Lawrence Parish. And you can see that, that by reporting week, and for each school in the district, you can see a breakdown of cases. In East Primary School, you can see during the reporting week of September 13th, there were between one and four cases, uh, and these were faculty. And for October 11th, there were between one and four cases uh, among students. Now, when cases are, when case counts are between one and four, we suppress that because we wanna protect um, privacy and reduce the risk of identification. But if these numbers are greater than four, you'll see that in this report. Now keep in mind that when a superintendent logs in, they'll only be able to see case counts for the schools in their district. They won't be able to see case counts for schools in other districts. Uh, superintendents can access this from a link and they would simply use their EID to log in. And this is the EID, I guess that's um, the same one that LDOE has provided to you. Uh, this report is updated once a week, and uh, again, the, the data are grouped by reporting week. Does anyone have questions?
We don't have any that have come right, in thank specific you. to this. Uh, so I think we're, we're okay. Thank you, Doctor. I think we can uh, continue. Great, right, thank you. All right, Dr. Mangoza. I think we're ready for the next slide. Yeah, we'll go to the next slide. Yes, ready for the next one. Yeah, the next slide is, is a slide that I'm sharing here. This is, again, Ken Bradford, Assistant Superintendent with the department. So uh, what we've been doing is we, we've been working with public health, and what we will be providing to school systems is we will be providing a, a survey um, whereby you can request the Binax test kits the jot form survey that we will be sending out to school systems uh, will require the following things, the, the name of a delivery location, a point of contact, delivery ad address, the CLIA wave certificate number, or the community provider who will be testing for you so we can obtain all the same information on them, and the number of Binax tests requested it's recommended that the number be based on 20% of your student population. And then we will collect all of that and we will forward that on to LDH and then LDH will disseminate the kits and follow up with you for further technical instructions. Just to give you a sense of the timeline on this, this is, you know, we found out about this opportunity just within the last couple of days. So we are working on that survey to get out to you uh, we plan to have that out by close of business tomorrow. And then we're going to ask that you complete that survey um, by a week from Friday, by November the 6th. And what we plan to do is on, on Friday, November the 6th, provide that information to, to LDH so that they can start the process of, of disseminating those. Uh, so I think what we'll do now is I'll, I'll ha ask to answer a couple of questions, and then I know I think both uh, Dr. Brumley and Dr. Cantor uh, ha have some remarks. So I did have three questions that, that came in, and so I want to ask those of our LDH counterparts. Um, the, the first question is, what about the rapid antigen tests that are in clinics, not the CARDs? Is, can you speak to that and, and give any background or context on, again, the rapid antigen tests that are in clinics currently? Sure, Ken, I can talk to that a little bit. This is Dr. Cantor. There's a number of different types of antigen tests that are available out there. Um, the Binax now cards being one of them. There's also uh, some rapid point of care PCR tests that are um, available at, at some clinics. The, the Binax now is really the only test that doesn't require an apparatus. It doesn't require a machine or any type of lab equipment to run it. it I mean, it's pretty much, it's most analogous to a pregnancy test. It's, it's a card with a little nose swab. You swab, you put it into the little card, you put a couple drops of reagent, and that's really all it is. It's self-contained. That's the advantages of it. The, the disadvantages, as Dr. Welch and, and many mentioned, are that it doesn't have quite the performance um, characteristics of, of more elaborate tests. Thank you, Dr. Cantor. Dr. Cantor, I have a, I'll ask you the next question, and that is uh, just someone from LDH elaborate a, a little bit more about the alternative diagnosis, diagnosis and, and specifically um, bronchitis how that is taken into consideration when doing an alternative diagnosis. Thanks, Ken. Um, you know, it's a tough question to answer in the abstract, but in general, when someone has symptoms of any type right now, and, and the challenge is that the symptoms of COVID, uh, particularly in kids, can look a lot like flu, can a lot look a lot like seasonal allergies, it's gonna look a lot like a stomach bug. I mean, it can really look a lot like a number of other conditions that, um, that schools are very familiar with. And so really, you know, there are two ways to determine that somebody is not 
um, a COVID risk to their peers or any close contacts that they might have in a school setting. One is to test the individual and to say, okay, it's not COVID. And the other is to have them evaluated by a clinician and have a clinician say, this is another diagnosis. So that's the essence of an alternative diagnosis. We, we, we feel that if, if a child um, or a staff member is evaluated by a clinician and, and the clinician feels ready to diagnose that individual with something that's not COVID, that um, you know, it, it, it's likely good enough to not necessitate examining close contacts and quarantining. Thank you, Dr. Cantor. Um, the next question is, if, if someone has close contact, how long should they wait before they provide a rapid test? So if somebody is a close contact of a confirmed case, that individual needs to quarantine. And they need to quarantine for a course of 14 days from that last point of contact, whenever that last point of contact was. Um, and we could get into the definition of a close contact you know, more if we need to, but anyone that's identified as a close contact needs to quarantine. And that's not just school children. I mean, that's, that's anyone out there right now. Now, it's a good idea for close contacts to get tested. Uh, because it's information and then, um, you know, it's, it's helpful. And the ideal time for close contact to get tested is probably around five days or so after that contact. That's when you have a decent chance of showing positive if, if you did actually get COVID. Not 100%, um, but a, a decent chance. The, the big caveat, though, is even if someone gets tested when they're close contact, and even if that test is negative, it doesn't obviate the need to maintain that 14-day quarantine. And the reason that is is because if you test, you still could be positive the next day. You still could be positive two days after that. You really could be positive at any point in that 14-day period. So, so testing helps. It's, it's another piece of information. Most people who need to quarantine are um, eager to test, but the rub is that a negative test still doesn't obviate the need for that full 14 day quarantine period. Thank you. Next one I believe will be for Dr. Mendoza. Um, and it's about the, the superintendent's reporting dashboard. And, and the question is coming, where, what is the data source for that particular dashboard? Uh, the data source is the COVID-19 early warning system that schools report to that goes to our ID EPI uh, unit that's led by Teresa Sokol. Thank you. Sure. And, and I think my next question is act, actually for Dr. Um, Sokol as well. Um, question is, if with the rapid tests, if there is a positive test, who, who reports that to LDH? Will the medical CLIA approved facility report that or would that be something that would have to be done through the early warning system or a combination of both so using one of the rapid tests who is responsible for the ultimate reporting to LDH okay so most likely it's going to be a combination of both so if those Binax now tests are performed off-site at a different location by some other sort of um, partnered by some provider with whom a partnership has been developed, then the actual reporting of the test results. Now, keep in mind that for COVID-19, all test results need to be reported by the facility that is performing those tests. So if the physician's office is conducting anti rapid antigen testing, they need to report positive results, negative results, and determinate results to us. And so it would be the responsibility of the site that is actually running those samples to report those laboratory results. Now, as far as the school reporting responsibility is concerned, they do not need to specifically report any results for any child that's been tested. 
What we're looking for with the early warning system is information about the suspected cases and the confirmed, those laboratory confirmed cases, because that's what we use to help work with the schools for the public health response, for the contact tracing, the quarantine, um, you know, making sure other measures within the school are appropriately in place. So that's what would be the responsibility of the school is to continue to report those results. But really, it's, all, it's not going to be all of them, not all the negatives, the indeterminates, all of that information that the facility performing the testing was. It's just the same sort of confirmed cases among students and staff and then suspected cases as well. That part would not change for, for school. Thank you. Uh, maybe this is for you, Dr. Cantor. Are, th are there any updates on when saliva testing may become available, test kits? Yeah, you know, saliva testing is out and available now. Um, it's, you know, the, the only difference really is how the sample is collected. A nasal swab versus um, saliva either running a, a brush inside the mouth or spitting into a bag are the two ways that it's out there. What doesn't change typically is what happens after that. And uh, most saliva testing available now is, is a send out lab, which means it's sent to some offsite lab and you get results back in two to three days, something like that. So practically for someone that wants to test and get results back, you know, whether it's a nose swab or whether it's a saliva sample, you're still typically, for those type of tests, having to wait, you know, two to three days to, to get results back. That's really the advantage of these antigen tests is that um, for someone that has symptoms and you want to get some information right away, you know, it's pretty much instant um, at the cost of uh, decreased accuracy, a little bit decreased accuracy. And I, I should mention also, Ken, you know, where these Buy Next Now tests came from, um, the federal government essentially has purchased the entire supply that the company has made. Abbott has made uh, you know, a certain number of tests in, in the millions. And, and the federal government has stepped in and basically purchased the entire supply that they've made. And the feds have turned around and distributed these to the states. They've also made some direct shipments to some colleges and, and universities. So Louisiana has obtained about 300,000 of these tests so far from the feds. We're expecting to obtain um, about 1.1 additional million. So we'll have 1.4 million uh, uh, when the shipments are all said and done. We are in turn making these tests available to partners in the state of which K through 12 schools are one. That's, that's, that's where this is coming from. We're not uh, being charged for these tests and so we're not collecting any money on them. We just want to make them available for any school that thinks they can use them. And as was mentioned, you know, one of the challenges for a school is that in, in order to uh, legally use these, you have to do it under this CLIA certificate or CLIA waiver. So for schools that already enjoy a uh, partnership with a clinic, either through a school-based health center or otherwise, that might already be in place. For schools that don't already enjoy those type of relationships, um, this would be an opportunity to, to forge those. But our interest is to make these tests and resources available to any school that thinks they would benefit from them. Thank you, Dr. Cantor. Okay, um, I, I will just before I turn it over to uh, Superintendent Brumley, I, I would just say we've had lots of questions about will, to, will this recording be available uh, and, the, and the presentation and the answer to that is, is yes. I'll work with our communications team to get these posted on the department site this evening on our Strong Start webpage on the Department of Education site. Uh, so at this time what I'll do is, oh, and I had one more question about is this available to uh, non-public schools and the answer is yes. I confirmed that with Dr. Richard earlier today. So yes, charter schools, non-public schools, in our public school systems, this, this opportunity is available to, to all school systems. Uh, again, we'll be sending out that JOT form survey for you by close of business tomorrow where you can start that process and they, all, all of those entities will be included. So at this time, uh, Dr. Brumley, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, thanks, Mr. Bradford. Uh, Dr. Cantor, if you could uh, come back on for just a moment. You and I had a, a couple of, I thought, uh, helpful exchanges um, maybe Monday 
that might be helpful for everyone um, just to kind of put some of this in even further layman's terms. Uh, first of all, the testing, I think, is a, is a really big and promising opportunity. Uh, at the same time, in order to um, have the test or conduct the test, uh, schools or systems have to have the uh, CLIA oversight. And so I know you mentioned it a little bit, but I think it might be um, just briefly, um, you know, systems that already have school-based health clinics, et cetera, they, they may already have those designations. But if, if they do not have a partnership with a, a, a clinic that has that, that CLIA endorsement or certification, those are my terms, um, then it would be now is the time for systems to, to try and reach out and, and find a partner that does have that uh, certification. Is that correct? Yeah, th those, those are excellent terms, Dr. Brumley. I, I think that's totally accurate. And, you know, oftentimes if a school is able to partner with any clinical entity, whether it's a clinic or a hospital or anything like that, um, that clinical entity most likely has one of these certifications. And it's as easy as then essentially writing a letter saying that we extend coverage of it to the school environment. What it really means is that that clinical entity is going to help with training whoever it is that's going to be administering the test and providing some measure of clinical and laboratory oversight over that. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And the, and the second question I have with you, and, and it's what we discussed uh, earlier in the week, you know, as I put my, principal, my school principal hat on, um, and I think about disruptions with tracing, and once we find a, a symptomatic individual and we look at, you know, who are the kids that were around this individual, and let's make sure they go home. And, you know, it has been a little, well, it's been a disruptive process. It's been the right process as we've learned more. Um, but th the information that uh, you and your team shared today, I think, is, is very helpful in limiting some of that uh, disruption. So I just want to go over that briefly one more time just to, to, to think it through in, from the classroom setting. So, you know, I use my, my little Johnny uh, terminology, but if, if, if Johnny is in high school math class and um, he has, you know, four kids within six feet from him for over 15 minutes under, the, under what, where we had been operating, we would then ask those students to uh, be away from the school for a period of time. But, but now that doesn't necessarily mean that. So that's going to limit some of that disruption. So if you could just one more time, because I think this is a really important uh, point of this conversation. One of the main reasons I wanted to have the call is just walk through like what this shift means to, you know, Johnny and, and Johnny's, you know, four classmates who might have been around him. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll say, I'll just back up a second. And, and Dr. Brumley and I have discussed this as well. I think we've all been encouraged with the experience to date of the return of in-person learning. I think um, it's proven that transmission in these settings have been kept relatively small. There are some exceptions, extracurriculars, f football programs, and so forth. But in the classroom, there's been not a lot of transmission, and that goes to the credit of everyone on this call for all the hard work that you've put in. And I mean that in all sincerity. What we have seen, though, uh, and, and you know much better than I, is disruption in education educational operations, particularly because of the need to quarantine close contacts of someone who's either a case or has enough symptoms that we're going to say we're going to quarantine presumptively in anticipation of a test coming back. So that's where the guidance change today should help a little bit. Previously, when somebody had symptoms enough to warrant testing and investigation, we would initiate the quarantine process for close contacts at that same point in time, presumptively. And then if the test came back negative, we can always go back and cancel the quarantine. That's obviously highly disruptive. It was done out of you know, an abundance of caution, so to say. The change in guidance now is to say, if Johnny has symptoms, Johnny's close contacts, whoever they might be, do not need to quarantine until 48 hours after the onset of Johnny's symptoms if we still don't have a test result back. If we get a negative test on Johnny within those 48 hours, we've essentially saved all those contacts having to quarantine. If 48 hours pass from the point that Johnny's symptoms began and we still don't have any test results back, then the quarantine has to happen. So it buys.
has a little bit of time, hopefully saves some of this the disruption. It's based on protocols that New York State has been piloting over the past month or two, and they've had some good results with it, so we felt comfortable with it. So really, under, under the new approach, the, the, the quarantine would only have to take place if Johnny's test came back positive or if the 48 hours passed and, and Johnny did not have a test. So at that point, you just, you're assuming you know, it could be positive. That's absolutely right. And it's, it's 48 hours from when Johnny's symptoms began. And the 48 hours expires when a test result, uh, the, the result has to be back in 48 hours. It's, it's not enough to say that Johnny got tested and it's pending at, at 48 hours. Yeah. And so that, you know, that, that would include with our elementary students where we have been cohorting, you know, it could be the whole class, you know, we've worked through that or, you know, at that middle or high school level, it could be just those kids that were within that, you know, proximity of, of him. So that is, that is really helpful. Thank you for that explanation. I, I just, I get a sense knowing, you know, what people on this call deal with every day that that like little walkthrough was probably helpful for them. Um, Dr. Canner, thank you so much to you and your team for staying connected with us and all the work that and attention you give us across the state. We appreciate that. I see Dr. Finger on the call from Children's, just not going to go without also thanking uh, Dr. Finger and Children's for their work at the same time. Uh, everybody out there in the school system, keep, keep up the great work. I hope this was um, helpful uh, and uh, we, will, we will continue to move forward together. Mr. Bradford, anything else? No, sir. We'll just get this uh, posted to the website this evening, the recording and today's PowerPoint presentation.